You might be surprised to learn that Barks got its start making other soft drinks before landing on the root beer it's known for today, on this episode of Antique Bottle Stories. Today's story starts with a guy named Edward Bark. He was born in Louisiana in 1871. His dad was a doctor, his mom was a piano teacher. He had three siblings. Now being French, his family had gone back and forth to France as a kid. He ended up going to University of Paris to study sugar chemistry. He was very interested in the beverage making process and how to make extracts. Upon coming back to New Orleans, he married Elodie in 1898. He started working at a sugar refinery He kept tinkering on the weekends with inventing new soft drinks. Finally, his interest got to the point where he wanted to go into business for himself. This brought him to Biloxi, Mississippi. He knew Biloxi had good tourist traffic. And in 1899, here we see that he bought a soda manufactory from a Martin Locher. His company name was called Biloxi Artesian Bottling Works. This photo says Ed Bark is on the right. This article tells the story from the beginning. It says he and his wife would bottle drinks by day and hand wash the bottles by night. They hired a helper and they would load 20 to 30 cases on a mule drawn wagon and stop by local stores, parlors and restaurants. At first he was only selling citrus flavors, including an orange drink that he won a blue ribbon for in the 1902 World's Fair. He was still working on his root beer formula at this point because he wasn't happy with the formula. He knew this was the drink he had to get just right. His grandson said it was his favorite product and the one he intended to go to the greatest heights. He concocted most of his formulas at home in his kitchen. Edward and Elodie had one son named Edward Jr. in 1900. By 1908, Edward felt like he finally perfected the root beer. With that, and with some new machinery, things started to take off. In 1908 is when I found the first Barks ad. Notice it says they're making 12 flavors, but they aren't making a big deal about the root beer yet. Here's a 1908 article that talks about Edward coming home from a hunting trip with six other guys, where they caught about 300 squirrels and a number of fish. Now here's 1909, here's an ad for Jersey Cream which I thought was maybe one of their drinks, but it's not. They were just a distributor for them. But look at this ad. It says, don't be prejudiced. (laughs) Another hunting trip in 1909, this time on Edward's motorboat named the Jersey Cream. Here's a 1910 ad for their ginger ale. A guy is cleaning a bottle showing how sanitary they are. Here's a 1911 article about Edward. He's considered a successful businessman and like many successful businessmen during this time, they're usually considered for positions within the city, like mayors, bankers, things like that. So he is on the board for the first ward. It says, in fact, there's scarcely a resident on the Gulf Coast who isn't thoroughly familiar with the words Barks Pop. It also mentions he's been a member of the Knight of Pythias and a member of East End Fire Company. I almost didn't think that this was a photo of him because he's wearing glasses here and has a mustache and in these he doesn't, but they all say that they're him. Here's a 1911 ad for Barks Pop highlighting their lemon soda and ginger ale. Here's a 1913 city directory. Notice the name still says Biloxi Artesian Bottling Works, but I didn't know this part. He's also running a Biloxi Macaroni Company. These say that the address is 220 Keller and 224 Keller. So let's go see if we can find those. Well, I think it's here in this empty lot because this guy is 226 and I can't find the number of this guy, but that's a bummer. Let's see if we can have better luck finding his house. It says 704 East Howard. Well, this side is the odd side, so this empty side would be it. Here's an article talking about issues about the school board since Edward Bark is chairman of the education committee. And this one says he's on the public building committee. He's a busy guy. 
Here's apparently a disgruntled guy writing a piece in the paper about his discontent with Bark. He says Alderman Bark is very much mistaken when he places such small value on Biloxi's trees with the remark old women's reasons and that the city has outlived such notions about trees. If Biloxi's trees are not the attraction for tourists, what is? Anyways, he had a bit more to say about Bark, including, let's hope we keep the axe out of Councilman Bark's hands. Now, I cannot find the date that the name changes to Bark's Bottling Works, but here we are in 1922. We see a few ads in the newspapers. They are now distributing for Chiro Cola and New Grape. This article says that Edward was described as a man of intelligence, foresight, and fairness. But one thing the friendly Frenchman disliked was paperwork. Nothing was done on paper, says his grandson. Many Barks root beer bottlers started popping up around in the 1930s. We had instant success, says one of the bottlers in Hattiesburg. This same bottler said, I never associated with a nicer person. He was a man of considerable ability. At the same time, he says, when it came to business matters, he was tight-fisted. It says he stubbornly did things old school, but was always clear what he envisioned for the business. In 1931, against his son's warning, he released his drinks in 12-ounce bottles, long before other companies thought about doing it. During the Depression, when rations put a damper on the soft drink industry, Edward Bark opened an automobile dealership and worked in real estate and banking. Here's a 1927 advertisement for Chevy cars or trucks that he is selling for $40 below list price. It says Barks Motor Company. This is while he's still running Barks Bottling Works, though the same year. Now I don't know how this guy found time to sleep. It took until 1934 till I really saw anything about the root beer. This article just recaps the history of how he came up with it. And here's a 1936 newspaper which really helps date the design of this bottle. Here's a 1937 article talking about the new location. Here, I zoomed in. It says, this location is at Lemieux Street and the railroad. Let's go find it. Okay, so I'm not sure if this is the same actual building or if it's been rebuilt, but it's a roofing company now. I wondered if that house was still there to kind of verify that that's the same house. And yep, it's still there. This article has a few more photos for us. Here's another photo of a bottle and a Barks truck. And here's another one. It looks like all these trucks would have been lined up right along here. Look at how they put the bottles in these trucks. Isn't that interesting? We've seen a lot of companies athletics teams through these videos. This one happens to have a boxing team. A couple years later, some new machinery is going into the new plant new filling machine, and a new bottle sterilizer. Here's an ad with apparently a new mascot, Billy Bark, spelled with a K. The other half of the ad shows a cooking class by a Stella Floyd, and under that, there's some recipes for sherbet using Bark's drinks. Here in 1941, it says Bark is building a $30,000 building that will be adjacent to his Howard Avenue location. I guess he must have lived at that one. That's the one we were looking at earlier. So I guess that building is gone as well. In 1943, Edward died. It says he captured the American dream several times over. He had more than 100 franchise bottlers by the time he died. After he died, his son Edward Jr. now runs the business. Apparently, Edward Jr. was so shaken up by his dad's death and the fact that he was the only man on earth now who knew the root beer formula, that I guess he was worried that something might happen to him before he would pass it on. So within 12 hours of his dad's death, he went to the lab where he took his 21-year-old son, William, and they worked on the formula for three straight days until William had it mastered. Bark's root beer continued to gain popularity and franchises kept popping up all over. They even had people in Syria asking for a franchise license, but they decided to keep it in America. In the 1960s, the FDA banned sassafras, one of the main ingredients in the root beer. They found that it may cause cancer. So that caused a big upset since the recipe was very precise. William quietly substituted a new ingredient and said, I don't think anyone even noticed. Here's a 1940 look at Edward Jr.'s family. 
He's married to Lillian and they had two boys and three girls. And just like his dad, he was involved in the city. Here he's elected head of Red Cross and president of Biloxi Chamber of Commerce. This 1952 directory shows the family involvement in the business. His mom, Elodie, is still secretary treasurer. Edward Jr.'s two sons, Edward III and William, are in here. William is vice president. His daughter, Ella, is keeping the books. And here's a photo of Edward Jr. at the Biloxi Parade. And here's another one with a bank vice president. In 1960, there was talk of a strike among employees. They're seeking higher wages and better working conditions. And there was another one in 1962 for the same thing. The second time I saw that they were back to work about six weeks later. In 1968, Elodie died at the age of 85. Two years later, in 1970, Edward Jr. died. He was president for 27 years. He ended up having a heart attack. His son, William, then took over. A year later, Edward III died. That's William's brother, Edward Jr.'s son. So he's down a lot of family that was helping run the place. By this time, Barks had actually started to decline a little bit. In the 1950s, there were 250 franchises. And by 1978, there were only about 50. The franchisees said that there was not enough support by the company, such as promoting. But the family did not have visions of being as big as Coca-Cola or some of those other big companies. In the 1960s, Barks was approached by some big companies that wanted to buy it, like Coca-Cola and Frito-Lay. William was getting more stressed with the government demands and not having enough family to man the business anymore. He weighed the pros and cons of selling the business, and they were given an offer by two guys named John Corner and John Out. William sat on the offer for about a year and a half. In 1976, William Bark hesitantly decided to go ahead and sell it to them. Here's a photo of William's son, Edward IV, standing with the new president of Bark's John Corner. The caption says, William's son, Edward IV, holds the first Barks bottle, vintage 1898. John holds the newer bottle. They're both standing in front of a portrait of Edward, the original founder of Barks. Now this 1995 article states that the plant only employs 12 people at this point. John Corner is still running it. He's been running it for about 20 years at this point, and they weren't sure of the future of Barks. A month later, Coca-Cola gets ready to buy it up, which it still owns to this day. So let's talk about bottles. It seems they kept the same basic pattern for most of the history of Barks. A few changes along the way. Up until a few minutes ago, I kind of thought they were exactly the same pattern, but I started to notice small little differences. I looked around on the internet for vintage ads to see if I could find some dates to connect with the different designs. This one says 1955. Notice the embossing here. Then there's the ACL here. And for those who don't know, that means applied color label. It's hard to tell what color this label is though. This one says 1956. This one's in color. This would be a year later. There's a couple differences I found so far. Let's look at them side by side. On the 55 one, the embossing goes all the way to here. And the 56, it stops up here to put that it's 12 fluid ounces. The whole label is different, slightly, but it's different. The 56 has a red label, like this ad here. While I was searching for old ads to compare, I found a photo of three variations. I found a 1960 ad in the paper, and it looks like it would be this one. A 1976, I would have to say it's this one again. 1988, I would have to say it's still this one. I would say that the guy in the 1995 is also holding this blue one. And that's what my bottle is. It has a 56 on the bottom. I don't know if that helps or not, but it doesn't have the ridged modern bottom, for instance, like this one. I tried to find the approximate year that this started happening on modern glass bottles, but I wasn't able to find one. My best estimation, it started happening somewhere in the 50s. So this one would be before that date. 
So my best guess would be that this bottle would be the early 50s. And here's my best estimate for a chart from just what I've gathered on this video. Anyways, let's call it a day for this one. I hope everyone has a wonderful day and thank you for watching.